But we begin tonight with the Senate candidate who appears to be following the same trajectory that Sarah Palin went through in September of 2008. That, tra that trajectory from more or less profound political obscurity to instant nationwide conservative stardom. I'm speaking, of course, of Christine O'Donnell, the Republican Senate candidate from the state of Delaware. She is already scheduled for her first high-profile right-wing event in Washington, D.C. That will take place tomorrow morning at the Values Voters thingy. Uh, when John McCain picked Sarah Palin to be his running mate right, back, right after the Democratic convention in 2008, the initial response was, uh, let's let Meghan McCain say it. My initial reaction was, who the hell is Sarah Palin, yeah. like everybody else, you know? Right, it was sort of a collective nationwide who? Uh, after we all figured out the answer to that question, and boy, howdy, did we, um, the, the, the next thing that everybody realized, the sort of instant, near-universal analysis of McCain's choice, was that it would help the McCain campaign attract women voters. And of course, obviously it would, right? That's totally rational analysis. You will get women voters because you are picking a woman candidate. Obviously, this is a signal to women voters in particular because the McCain campaign has been trying very hard to attract women voters. McCain is counting on the appeal of Palin's life experience to connect with women voters who care about breaking that elusive barrier. The latest Newsweek poll shows McCain getting a big bounce with white women voters. Nearly a quarter of those women saying they're more likely to vote for McCain with Palin on the ticket. That was a totally reasonable analysis of what was going on at the time. It was also seemingly, as everybody reported it, a reasonable reaction, initial reaction to the surprise choice of Sarah Palin at the time. But how did it work out? The assessment that it was going to help um, wasn't based on Sarah Palin's stance on the issues. The assessment that Sarah Palin would help with women voters was based specifically on the fact that she was a woman. And for all of the impact that the choice of Sarah Palin had on the presidential election, on presidential politics that year, on Republican politics since that election, uh, for all of the impact that, that Sarah Palin has had on everything in American politics, one thing the choice of Sarah Palin did not do was earn John McCain women voters. I mean, to be fair, we can't say historically how many women voters he would have gotten without Sarah Palin, but he did really poorly with women voters with her on the ticket. For example, in the prior election of all the women who voted that day, the proportion of women who voted for George W. Bush was 48 percent. He got 48 percent of the female vote. In the following election, given the choice of John McCain and Sarah Palin, the Republican proportion of the female vote dropped from 48 percent to 43 percent. The proportion of women who voted Republican dropped five points despite the fact that Republicans had a woman on the ticket in Sarah Palin. So take heed, people analyzing this year's elections. Although women candidates equal women voters seems to make sense, also check the evidence that women vote for their own interests, not just for their own chromosomes. As of this week, we now know what the matchups are going to be for this year's national elections, and there's a huge number of women Republican candidates on the ballot. This has led to lots of interesting questions about whether this mean, re, means Republicans are going to attract a lot more of the female vote. I recognize that it's easy to, to look at candidates and say, look, women, I wonder what the other women will do in reaction to the sight of these women. But if past is any prologue about this specific phenomenon, this specific phenomenon of modern conservative Republican women drawing in women voters, we don't just have to speculate. There is quantifiable information here, and it suggests that the issues on which the candidates run can matter to women voters much more than the fact that the candidate herself is a woman. And that brings us to what remains, I am stunned to say, what remains the great, unacknowledged, big honking policy issue in this year's elections nationwide. We're now able to add yet another Republican Senate nominee to the roster of truly radical anti-abortion crusading candidates in this year's elections. Now, j just being anti-abortion is almost mandatory for Republican candidates across the board these days as the party continues its purge of its moderates. But what we have this year is beyond just being anti-abortion. There are now at least five Republican Senate nominees, five, who not only think that the government should outlaw abortion nationwide, they think there should be no exceptions made for anybody who's the victim of incest or who is the victim of rape.
How do you feel about abortion? Are you for abortion, against abortion, if you're for it? In what instances would you allow for abortion? I, I am pro-life, and I'll answer the next question. Um, I, I don't believe in the exceptions of rape or incest. Is there any reason at all for an abortion? Uh, not in my book. I'm, so in other words, rape and incest would not be something? You know, I'm a Christian. Right. And I believe that God has a plan and a purpose for each one of our lives and that he can intercede in all kinds of situations. And we need to have a little faith in many things. I'm not sure what you're supposed to have faith in, that you can get an illegal abortion if the government makes it legal, it makes it illegal, that God will help you in some other way. I don't know what you're supposed to have faith in, but that was Republican Senate candidate Sharon Engel of Nevada. Uh, before her, we heard from Republican Senate candidate Ken Buck of Colorado, both putting themselves down in the no exceptions category when it comes to reproductive rights. Then there's Republican Senate candidate Rand Paul of Kentucky. Back in February, Rand Paul told the Kentucky Right to Life Association that he opposes abortion even in the cases of rape or incest. Earlier this month, Republican Senate candidate Joe Miller of Alaska was added to the list. Miller has described himself as unequivocally pro-life, including cases of rape and incest. And now we have Republican Senate candidate Christine O'Donnell of Delaware, her campaign confirming to us today that she imposes abortion in all cases, including rape and incest. Until recently, the position that those five Republican Senate nominees have until recently, that was considered a fringe position, even in the anti-abortion movement. Even super pro-life politicians, almost as a standard disclaimer, would say that women who are pregnant because of a rape or pregnant because of incest should be allowed an exemption, even as they wanted to make all other abortions illegal. That exemption is apparently now over. What these Republican candidates are talking about is the federal government not only monitoring every pregnancy in the country to ensure that it ends the way the government prefers which is a live birth. But they're also saying that the government should force rape victims. The government should force rape victims under pain of criminal prosecution to give birth to their rapist's baby. The government must force that income anytime somebody becomes pregnant as the result of rape. If you are a 14-year-old girl who is raped by your uncle or by your father, the government will force you as a 14-year-old to give birth to the child that is the product of that incestuous rape. Remember, this is the year of small government conservatives, getting government out of your life. Government just small enough to... Yeah, this is obviously awkward for the whole libertarian character of this year's conservative uprising, the supposed libertarian character, the whole freedom thing, right? But it also represents a historic swing of the pendulum in terms of the emphasis on these culture war issues. Yes, maybe women will be super enthused about the idea of voting for female candidates just because those candidates are female. Maybe, uh, maybe all, all, all sorts of voters will do like they've done in the past and vote on abortion and other women's issues rather than just on which candidates are themselves women. Suppose Senator John Doe puts forth a constitutional amendment that would outlaw abortion, even in cases of rape or incest, and he asks you to attend the announcement and support him in that. Would you do it? Um, I would. I would. Yes, um, uh, a proposal like that, I would stand by it. Joining us now is Princeton University professor and MSNBC contributor Melissa harris Lacewell. Uh, professor harris Lacewell, thank you for joining us. Can we please have the whole hour, Rachel? This one is really, <laughs> there's a lot here. <laughs> I'm going to make my first question very short so you can just start. <laughs> Huh? <laughs> what do you what do you make of this, Melissa? <laughs> well, again, you, you've got really a lot of complicated things going on here. On the one hand, this kind of group of insurgent young women in the GOP who are doing something that, you know, scholars of women's politics would say is very unlikely. They are running with little experience, um, with little name recognition against incumbents. I mean, this is precisely why we've said we don't have many women um, in national government is precisely because it is so hard to be a person of less experience running against an incumbent. So on the one hand, there's this little tiny bit of me that wants to cheer for the fact that you have women candidates willing to be sort of courageous enough to put themselves forward in this very tough political situation. On the other hand, let's be completely clear about the facts here. There is no place in the world and no time in history 
where restricting women's reproductive rights makes a people or a nation more free or more equal. These extreme positions on abortion are without any question a war on American girls and women, and the fact that there are women who are both complicit and participatory in it is really neither surprising nor unprecedented. It has always been true, and it is incredibly important that we recognize that despite the fact that we can be very proud of these women as women and as politicians, that the question is how do women as citizens fare on the other side of them either being elected or not elected? We now have at least five Republican Senate candidates on the record espousing this view of no exceptions uh, to a nationwide abortion ban, even in cases of rape or incest. This is, uh, the reason I say that I'm stunned by this not getting more attention is this is unprecedented to have this many real anti-abortion radicals running for national office at this high a level. But do you think that we've got five of them, we've got so many of them, because that view is becoming mainstreamed in Republican politics or just because we just have extreme candidates running this year? You know, I, I don't have the evidence yet that this has become a mainstream view. What I suspect is actually that it has more to do with kind of our ignorance of our understanding about women's life experiences, even as women. When you talk about the rape and incest clause, I suspect that many Americans, maybe even many pro-choice Americans, think that rape and incest and pregnancy resulting from it is a pretty unusual occurrence. They suspect that, you know, that maybe there's a, there's a few dozen women and for whom that would make a difference in any given year. Um, but the fact is that sexual assault is an embarrassingly common experience. And I don't mean embarrassing for those who are victimized, but rather embarrassing that in our country, it's still true that one in four girls and women is likely to be sexually assaulted in their lifetime. And we know that particularly in cases of incest, the, the question of possible pregnancy, because incest is often a repeated violation and one that does not often include um, protection, uh, that the possibility of pregnancy is very real. We're talking about hundreds of women, thousands of women in pregnancies. And, and, and look, I, I'm from a people who really did experience the need to hold on to a God who would, who would see them through difficult times, including generations of black women who in slavery were forced to bear the children of their rapists. And I do believe, because I'm a person of faith in an interceding God that can, that can help people through difficult circumstances, but I'm also an American who believes that the point of government isn't to make life so hard for half of our citizens that the only force there to help them is God. We as a government and as a people deserve and should do better. Princeton University professor and MSNBC contributor Melissa Harris Lacewell, um, who didn't write what she just said right there. She just said it because she can do that. Uh, you're, you're amazing. <laughs> Melissa, thank you. Thanks, Rachel.